Hello, everyone. This is Carol Hinkle, your president. I'm really happy to welcome you today. I hope that you appreciate it's not snowing today. So that's wonderful. A couple of things I wanted to mention. One is don't forget to ask questions at the end. We really need your questions. And I say at the end, they can be during the lecture, during the question and answer period. Just hover over the bottom of your screen if you have a computer and you'll see the Q&A icon. Just click on it, at, type in your question and push send. If you have an iPad, it would be at the top of the screen. So the same procedure. We really count on you to ask questions. Also, the other thing I wanted to mention is if you'd love to see this great lecture again, look on the, the email that Glenn sent out to you with instructions on how to do that. Um, so you can start looking for this again next week on CCTV, either next Thursday, either on online or on the screen. So I'd now like to ask Beth Wood, please, our program chair, to introduce today's speaker. Beth? Thanks, Carol. It's a real privilege to welcome today's speaker, Patricia Whalen. Patricia served as a judge for over 20 years in the United States and as an international judge in the War Crimes Chamber of Bosnia and Herzegovina for five years. She was a special advisor to the court in Bosnia and Herzegovina on judicial skills related to war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and gender-based violence. Patricia is a founding member of the Afghan Judicial Education Program facilitating cross-cultural judicial learning in the US and Afghanistan. She designed and directed for 10 years the Vermont Afghan Judicial Education Program. And that's just scratching the surface of her CV. Um, she's here to talk about a lot of those experiences here today. And it's a distinct pleasure to welcome Patricia Whalen. Well, thank you. Um... I learned how to unmute myself, so I'm starting off on the right foot, I hope. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to share the story of the Afghan Judicial Project with you. And this project ran in Vermont and also in DC from 2003 to 2014. It was sponsored by the International Association of Women Judges, uh, which I will refer to as the IAWJ. The IAWJ is currently involved in the evacuation of Afghan judges from Afghanistan, and we are hoping to bring some of these judges to the United States. I have titled this presentation, First They Come for the Judges, um, because this is what happened in 1995 when the Taliban took control of Kabul. All women were told to leave their jobs, especially women in government uh, employee, but the Taliban specifically came and removed the women from the courts. The Vermont, let me just see if I can get my screen here to go to my next slide, which I'm failing to do. Um, I think I just need another. Hmm. Here we go. Um, the, uh, these are our project partners, and this uh, project was supported and sponsored by these organizations, as well as hundreds of volunteers um, it, throughout Vermont, but primarily in southern Vermont, where I'm from. The Rural Women Leadership Institute of Vermont consisted of myself and three other women in southern Vermont. We were friends, we were all involved at the time in different fields. My partners were Julie Peterson, who was in government and politics, uh, Ann Fielder, who worked in healthcare and worked for Planned Parenthood, and Connie Woodbury, who worked internationally at World Education. We were all interested in doing something together internationally, um, and especially on women's leadership issues. 
In 2003, I had the opportunity to attend an IAWJ conference in Washington, D.C. And at that time, I met Judge Marzia Bazul, and she, she was from Afghanistan, and she was there. She was hosted by the White House, and she was somewhat like, you know, uh, uh, a poster judge, let's say, uh, representing the new opportunities for women uh, uh, in Afghanistan. And just as a bit of a, you know, history refresher, uh, the Taliban were in power from uh, 1995 to 2001. And if you remember, um, they retreated essentially after the US bombing um, for their failure to turn over Os Osama bin Laden. The new government that took over was heavily supported by the US and Western countries. Um, and that continued until the recent takeover uh, by the Taliban this past summer. Um, Marzia in 2003 was the kind of the first wave of women to have her rights restored. I, when I met her, I asked how could I help? And she had replied that I could help with judicial training. And we talked a little bit about like, what would that look like? Uh, and what, what type of training did she think was appropriate? She had already been exposed in DC to uh, some judicial opportunities uh, in the United States. And she felt for the most part that the courts in our larger cities were too in, would be too intimidating for most of the judges. And in fact, at that time I learned that most of the courthouses in Afghanistan did not even have electricity. Uh, I told her about Vermont and said, well, we did things at a bit slower pace and we had very unfussy courtrooms. And I think Vermont turned out to be a perfect laboratory for learning about the rule of law. Um, my friends, the group back in Vermont, they wanted to also do something broader than just judicial education. Uh, we were interested in sharing our lives with them and we wanted them to see how we live. So we had them stay in our homes. They did not stay in um, hotels or inns. Um, we wanted them to meet our partners, our children. We wanted to share cooking with them and just see all of the places where we believed we would have common ground. And we also wanted to share our problems, what type of problems we had, uh, perhaps personally, but broader as a community and how we would resolve those problems with the hope that they would also share theirs. So let's see, um, whoops, I'm getting there. So this is um, a year later after 2003, um, and with, with many volunteers over that past year, um, we began hosting the first group of judges. And these, um, oh, you know what, I have to stop this. Sorry for my inadequate um, skills here. Um, I wanna go back for a minute. Um, this, uh, was at Hilltop Montessori. This was a, a private school in Brattleboro, Vermont. And uh, we took them to both public and private schools and we discussed issues in education. And we talked about how taxation works or doesn't work. And of course, like it was Vermont. So we did a lot outside. We walked a lot, we hiked a lot. We were off in the woods which was a very new experience for them as these were very urban judges. And, okay. Uh, this is also uh, taking place at Hilltop. And I put this in here to mostly show you my son. <laughs> He's the boy that's showing um, them how uh, they built a bread oven. And he was talking about how the oven worked. Uh, standing next to the, him with the headscarf on is Judge Anissa Rizzouli. And um, uh, Judge Rizzouli was a very young judge in 2004, 
Um, she is the only judge that's been nominated to the Afghan Supreme Court. And in fact, uh, she was nominated twice, uh, once under Karzai, uh, the vote failed by a few votes in their parliament. And she was again appointed by Ghani. Uh, that vote never came to pass because of the takeover by the Taliban. In this picture, um, she's also explaining how they bake bread in Afghanistan and they were sharing recipes. And this experience stayed with my son. And today he is a software developer, but he created and managed as a volunteer, the huge uh, database that we're currently using of over 1400 people and contains all of their documents, which uh, essentially fuels our evacuation. Now one, uh, uh, um, object um, and goal of this project was actually to create a network among the judges of supportive and lasting relationships. And uh, we, since we're all friends with them years later, um, I think this, this is one goal we achieved, um, as well as them beginning to establish their own network within Afghanistan. We wanted to have fun, so we wanted to play sports. We took them bowling, we uh, did yoga, we played volleyball, um, it was great fun. We also um, introduced them to our healthcare system and we made sure that they had uh, visits to the dentist, um, doctors, optometrists, whatever they needed. Now this picture here um, is really about, oh, I don't know why it's doing that. So I have to kind of go back again, sorry. Um, this is just an evening at home. Um, this was at my house at the time. And we wanted them to also experience uh, just very easy, comfortable socializing with men. Um, and which was something that uh, I can honestly say was pretty foreign to them at the time. Uh, especially, especially just easy and kind of respectful relationships. They were really curious about, um, you know, what we did for fun. Um, and so we showed them a little bit of Vermont, playing music, talking to each other. Now, every night we had a dinner and each night that dinner had a different topic. Uh, this dinner was hosted by women judges in Wyndham County. Uh, and we would just talk about what our problems are. Now this uh, dinner here, uh, the focus of that was religion. And we met, whoops, let me go back a minute. We met with um, uh, ministers, an Episcopal priest, uh, a rabbi. Uh, we brought together different women from different faith communities. This was a very interesting, uh, evening, because we talk really about our faith as children. What were we raised with as children? And then what were the dilemmas with that faith when we became adults and could perhaps question it or raise issues of, uh, for example, gender equality? And you can imagine that was a very lively um, conversation. Uh, again, in this picture, in the red headscarf, you see Judge. Rizzoli. Now, um, I showed you um, accidentally the picture of driving. Here we go. Um, they wanted to learn how to drive. Um, this picture was taken in 2006. And at that time, um, only five years had gone by since the Taliban. And they really were still worried about what would happen if they came back. And they wanted this time to be able to drive themselves, get away. Um, and so we started teaching them how to drive. Although about 20 minutes after this picture was taken, uh, we totaled that car. Our driving lessons didn't go over that great. Um, the core of the program was uh, the rule of law, of course, and they witnessed, they came to court with us, they, we exposed them to all of the courts in Vermont, the Supreme Court, 
the superior court, district court, family court. And we really focused on what areas of law that they were interested in and then tried to match them up with hearings. We had lectures. Uh, many were delivered by um, the, our other judges in the Vermont system. They gave generously of their time. And I think what was really important here was that, um, and the, especially the lectures given by male judges, where we, and we were quite surprised by this, that the respect they got as colleagues um, from the male judges really had a significant impact on them. The program, as I mentioned, also uh, went to Washington, D.C. And uh, here they are, they were hosted by the US Supreme Court, by the women justices. And here you see Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, they were lovely. And every year we did the program, uh, the women justices at the court uh, hosted them and had a special tea for them. And it was quite meaningful. Now, I just want to stop for a minute and just explain that in 2007, uh, the Afghan Women Judges Association and the IAWJ sponsored a conference in Afghanistan. And at that time, there were 100 women judges. Uh, uh, 92 of them actually made it to this conference, uh, which was held in February uh, during very difficult uh, travel. And this is um, myself and the director at the time of the IWJ arriving in Kabul. This is the old airport, not the current one that you saw in the news in August. Uh, the air, this airport at the time when we arrived didn't have electricity. It was like dark. It was just unbelievable, actually. And we were pretty happy to get outside. Um, I was invited to give the keynote speech um, at the conference. Uh, and which was the reason why I was there. We were there for two weeks and we did, we had many meetings uh, with government officials, with their Supreme Court, uh, the Minister of Justice, um, you know, the IWJ had an agenda. We very much at the time wanted to see a woman on the Supreme Court or to improve the status of women judges within Afghanistan. Um, our, um, we were also ha had funded um, through the assistance of the US State Department a program for young girls throughout Afghanistan. Uh, we went to the high schools. Um, there, this is uh, a, one of the uh, students with her diploma. Um, and we did a course, they had designed a course that the Afghan judges then taught on human rights and uh, gender equality um, and uh, the rule, rule of law issues. And this is a particularly poignant, I have many of these pictures. Um, these young girls are now the women that you see demonstrating in Afghanistan on the news. And of course, now these girls uh, who are now women, um, they're being detained, many have gone missing. Uh, it's, um, it's, very difficult time uh, for us who have worked with them. Um, and I just want to remind you that it was US dollars that sponsored these programs and gave these um, girls, you know, hope for the future. And now um, that future is erased for them. This uh, is just a picture of the conference itself. And again, you know, um, since 2003, uh, the US, the EU, the UK, um, they have put millions of dollars into the training and development of the judiciary. Uh, they heavily subsidize the building and establishment of courts. New modern courtrooms were built um, and courts were um, specifically established um, to uh, fight corruption, terrorism, and drug trafficking. These were very serious and intense um, uh, courts. They also established courts to eliminate violence against women. 
The number of women judges over this period of time increased to 270. They sat in all these courts and they presided over many. Now, this is a picture of Judge uh, Zakia Harari um, in 2007 in Vermont on her, the last day of her trip. Um, in January, this past year, in January of 2021, she was assassinated on her way to work with another judge. And for me, this marked the beginning of the end uh, for women in the judiciary in Afghanistan. The next nine months after the assassination were filled with you know, worry, confusion. Uh, we were all could see that the peace negotiations had failed. Um, women were inadequately represented on those negotiations. And everyone had fear about the US military withdrawal. On July 15th, um, 2021, the IWJ met virtually with about 40 judges in Kabul. And we had been working with the support of the Max Planck Foundation um, on a, 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 like a project to revamp the Afghan Women Judges Association itself. And they were, they were at an interesting place as an organization aside from everything else. Uh, the older judges, many of the judges who came to Vermont, and that, and I should mention that at the time, Vermont, um, one third of the judiciary actually came to Vermont. Um, we hosted 35 women during that period of time. They were now sort of the old guard. Uh, the younger judges wanted to take over. Um, and we and the, they were also at the same time exploring what would the what would the future look like? What what was their vision for the future? And we had hoped that that was going to be a very hopeful conversation. Um, but of course, what took place was the opposite of that. Um, the Afghan judges only wanted to talk about um, their what was going to happen to them if the Taliban came back. Absolutely no one wanted to leave. Uh, these are women who love their country, uh, but they were worried. Uh, the older judges remembered the Taliban, the younger judges did not. Um, and they asked us at that meeting, if Kabul fell to the Taliban, would we help them leave the country? And without ever understanding what that meant, uh, you know, we, of course, said yes. Uh, a committee of seven judges was formed. We got our old interpreter back from our Vermont program, and we set up a hotline for the judges. We thought we were going to have months to prepare. On August 14th, um, Judge Anissa, uh, we had a Zoom conversation. And she told me, um, she said, Patty, the Taliban's already here. And I was like, what? I just finished watching the news that predicted the fall of Kabul at some point in time in 2022, that there would be months to be ready. And she said, no, they're here. They're here. It's over. And I asked her if she wanted to leave. And she said, you know, for myself, no, but she had responsibility for her nieces and nephews who lived with her um, and fa other family members. She said, no, I, she said, we can't stay. Um, she said, they're gonna come looking for me. Um, and in fact, that turned out to be true. Um, but we, what we did um, is I sent out a message. I said, you know, Anissa says that the Taliban are already in Kabul. We notified our judges. Uh, we told them to um, start un uploading all their documents to us. And this is the project that my son did. Uh, we were very worried, or they were very worried if they were caught with their uh, court IDs, 
um, diplomas, their educational uh, records, uh, that that would be used against them. Uh, so many of them destroyed those documents or they buried them or they hid them. Um, and uh, we asked them to send all of that to us so we could have it available to them for the future. And uh, so on August 15th, as we all know, um, all hell broke loose. Um, and I assume, I assume most of you followed the coverage at the airport. Um, the first thing we did was contact Senator Leahy um, and asked him, how can we get people um, out? How can we pe get people into the airport? Um, and he had connected us with someone who actually was on the State Department side that was located inside the airport. And through um, many conversations, um, we learned that if we could get our judges into the airport, um, they would be able to get them out and into the United States. Our team at the time, just so you know who the seven judges were, um, we were internationally um, a group. Uh, the, uh, the head of our team is the president of the IWJ, uh, Susan Glazeberg, and she's on the Supreme Court of New Zealand. Uh, we had judges uh, from Australia, uh, the UK, Spain, uh, Canada, um, and I have another uh, partner judge in the United States, Judge Vanessa Ruiz, um, who uh, is on the DC Court of Appeals. And Vanessa as well had, uh, she was worked in the DC part of the program uh, for the same years that, uh, that I did. And we all knew these judges. Um, I think between all seven of us, we knew most of the judges in Afghanistan. You know, we just had no idea what we were doing. And I think that was true for most of the civil society groups that were attempting to get out their friends or their colleagues from Afghanistan. The truth was we were doing the work of governments and there was no government, uh, at least initially, that was willing to help us. So this is what it looked like. We were um, told to get our judges to the airport. Uh, this is what it looked like on the outside. They were um, uh, had to go through a gauntlet of Taliban at different stages. Um, this particular, what you're looking at here is Taliban just um, arbitrarily, they're beating that old man with a whip. Uh, they have these flat boards that they were threatening women and hitting women. We did have judges that were beaten. Uh, it was, you know, I, every time I look at this picture, I also think of our military and, you know, we have the, one of the most sophisticated militaries in the world but ultimately they were defeated by whips and boards. Um, this is what it looked like on the outer perimeter of the airport. I mean, just huge crowds. And you begin to see that among these crowds, um, it was extremely difficult for women and children. They were just crammed in there. We were told that they needed to get to a gate um, and, you know, how could, uh, you know, women and children really do this? And if you look at this picture here, and I've looked at this picture so many times, I mean, this is like the enter, the, the, how you would begin to enter um, towards a, a path to a gate. And I can't even see any women and children here. Um, it was just, it was quite difficult for them. Um, this is a picture at the night, at night and somebody standing in the sewer. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the average time to get to a gate uh, was between 20 and 28 hours. Very, um, very difficult experience. 
um, if you can just imagine, first of all, just standing for that length of time um, alone. Now, I don't know if this is gonna, I'm gonna try to do this. Uh, this one may not work. I have, oh, here we go. I have, Uh, that's in front of the Hotel Baron that later was the site of the um, uh, bombing that took place uh, at the airport. Uh, but I wanted to show these to you Wait a minute. Um, let me show you this one, mostly because the pictures I'm showing you of the airport are obviously silent pictures, uh, but the noise, the gunfire, the confusion that was going on was constant. It was the whole 24 seven that while people were trying to push their way into the gate, this is what they were hearing. And hopefully I can get this going as well. It was really terrifying. Um, this is a closer picture of the sewer. Um, as uh, people got closer, uh, they actually had to get into this. This is an open sewer. And as you can see for adults, it's up to their knees. Uh, and children, there was no way children could get through this. Uh, if they walked in the sewer, they uh, could drown. And parents uh, could only get through uh, if they had enough arms to carry their children. And uh, some of these families had four or five children and it was just impossible to, to do that. And these were open sewers, so it was filled with exactly what you expect it to be filled with. Um, it was just pretty disgusting. Again, here are people carrying children, standing in the sewer, um, uh, trying to continue to make their way to a gate. Once you got closer to the gate and you can see the crowd uh, further on in this picture, uh, you began to see soldiers uh, for the first time. And what we were told was they needed to get uh, the attention of a soldier. Uh, there's an excellent article written in the Atlantic by George Packer, which explains everything that we went through and we experienced at the airport from the point of view of military veterans who were trying to uh, help their friends left behind in Afghanistan. Uh, it's a really amazing article and I would urge you to read it. Um, the uh, people that were in the military that were trying to assist other SIVs or other uh, people that they were trying to get out of Afghanistan, they had the advantage in that they could actually contact uh, these soldiers on the wall. They could, you know, call up, find somebody that knew somebody that was on duty and get their attention that way. We didn't have those resources. None of us were in the military. Um, but we did get help and assistance from the Polish special forces. And that was because a judge and uh, a lawyer actually in Poland um, offered to help us and had contacts uh, with the Polish military. Uh, this here um, was the bridge and you can see uh, the soldiers standing on the bridge and they're clearly looking for people, they're calling out to people, they're holding up um, some sort of card or ID, I don't exactly know what that is. Um, they might actually have a list, so they were calling names out if anybody responded to the name. Um, it was a very chaotic scene. We were told um, we needed some sort of code, some sort of way to get the attention of the Polish soldiers. They instructed us to um, have our judges and their family members 
uh, write uh, this symbol that you see, which is the first letter for judge in, um, uh, in Polish. Uh, and also to put a PL um, outside their names. Now, night was coming on and we were pretty worried that no one would actually see this. Despite the fact that they would be waving their hands, uh, we were worried that this uh, wasn't enough. So the Polish uh, soldiers gave us a code word to use. And it was Krakow. And the soldier at the time said to me, yes, Krakow, he goes, because we'll never forget. And I think at that point, the, just the enormity of what we were doing and trying to do, it was just overwhelming. Um, it was really the only time I broke down and just sobbed, really. Um, but uh, this is what got the attention of the Polish soldiers and did allow some of our judges to get um, through. Here we are inside the airport. Um, I understand the airport was just, I mean, there was over 100,000 people inside this airport. Uh, this small section here was uh, where the Polish soldiers were staying um, and they gave their cots uh, to the people they rescued. Now, um, uh, just, uh, let me maybe just go back for a minute here. We were able to get about 10 judges um, and 50 members of their family out uh, through the help of the Polish Special Forces. Another eight judges got through uh, with the assistance of other groups such as Team America. Uh, and those judges were able to come to the United States. A few judges got assisted, uh, were assisted by the Romanian government. There had been a project that Romania had sponsored on commercial courts and they needed to evacuate their entire staff that was in Afghanistan. And they took many of the people that worked on this project as well, many of the Afghans. There were a few judges that had visas to the UK um, and they were also able to get into the airport and were evacuated. All of these evacuations were miracles. Um, they were really a testament to um, their, the judges' perseverance and, frankly, luck. Now, since the airport closed, um, all the judges are in hiding. Uh, the, the Taliban is hunting them, all, and it goes in spurts. Uh, um, Almost immediately uh, after we got Judge Rizzoli out, she, um, and, and I just should say here, I'm really grateful to Poland um, because they were not able to get out themselves by getting to a gate in the airport. They had too many small children. Um, they were primarily uh, women and children. They, uh, but the special forces came out into the city and grabbed them and took them and brought them into the airport. Um, and we're very grateful for that. Um, again, though, since the airport closed, um, uh, all of the judges are in hiding that, are, that remained in Afghanistan. And this is uh, one of the judges' homes after the Taliban came in and uh, searched it and, uh, you know, looking for the judge who fortunately was not there. Their bank accounts are frozen. Uh, relatives um, of theirs have been detained and beaten and in some instances even killed. This is a letter from the Supreme Court uh, to uh, notifying another court that the Taliban has ordered um, uh, and uh, one of the judges there to be assassinated. Uh, and this is quite common. We have several of these letters um, and it's very disturbing. Uh, almost immediately over the takeover of Kabul, the uh, Taliban took over the Supreme Court itself. So they had all of the personnel records of the judges. 
Now, um, I just want to say that the um, what we've done since this time is very complicated. Um, we have gotten out approximately 160 judges and their families. Um, that that the total group of people is about 800. Um, most of them are in uh, temporary stays in countries awaiting visas for permanent resettlement. Um, since the withdrawal, the U.S. has not let any women, uh, or any of the women judges into this country. We have 90 judges still in Afghanistan with about uh, 500 family members. So um, this is for us an unfinished story. Our, our team uh, continues to fight. We have it, now it's visas, visas, visas. We are going everywhere looking for visas. We have judges in countries uh, from Korea to Brazil to uh, Albania, Kosovo, uh, Greece, and the UAE. Uh, none of these are permanent, uh, and Poland. Uh, none of these are. Uh, the judges there are there for permanent resettlement. Most of them speak English and they want to go to English speaking countries. Uh, and it's primarily Australia, New Zealand, the UK, uh, Canada, and the US. Uh, Australia, New Zealand have been taking judges and they would take a few all along. Uh, also, many judges want to go to Germany. They have family there and as well. Uh, the Germany is just beginning to, again, take a few more. Uh, the UK, uh, we're hoping that they will take a few more judges. All of this is very difficult. I mean, we're five months. We can't get them to open their doors. Uh, Canada is just beginning to take a few judges. Uh, I'm very hopeful that the U.S. will eventually uh, give us a path forward to get our judges into um, the United States. But as I said before, there's been no judges allowed entry into the United States um, since the uh, airport was closed. We actually, I should take that, today actually we had one judge that uh, uh, she's in the air, but I assume she's going to land uh, this evening in San Francisco. Uh, she's a recipient of a uh, fellowship program at Berkeley. Um, and she was actually given a J visa, which was very unusual. Uh, we have the judges uh, Nisa Razuli, as well as Judge Nafisa, who's president of the Afghan Women Judges Association. Both of them have uh, teaching fellowships at Yale University, which we can't get them in. <laughs> Either can Yale. Uh, so I just want to leave with a few hopeful pictures here. Uh, this is Judge Rizzoli, uh in Poland. Um, they uh, Poland has been really great uh, to our judges, and uh, they're have been very kind to help them with resettlement issues. Um, but Judge Anissa wants to come and has host families and everything waiting for her in Vermont. And that's where she wants to be. Um, these are two judges that were resettled in Ireland. Uh, the front, the, the judges in the front are Irish judges that are their sponsors. Uh, and in the back, you see the two Afghan judges. Uh, this is, these are just pictures this week. Uh, this is a little girl that arrived in Vancouver meeting a relative. This is the first judge we've been able to get into Canada. And this is the family here uh, arriving. So I wanted to leave this on a very hopeful note, um, but the truth is, as I said before, this is an unfinished story and 
we have a long way to go with a lot of unknowns. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And we have a number of questions. Um, for starters, how were the Afghan women informed about opportunities for them in legal careers? And how did they receive a legal education? Uh, in Afghanistan? Yes. Uh, yeah. um, well, they, there's universities in Afghanistan. Uh, Kabul University is a well-known school. And uh, they are, it's a civil law country. Uh, so they uh, train their uh, lawyers a bit differently than we do here. Uh, usually it's an undergraduate program. So a person goes to the university, they major in law, they come out with a degree in law, and then they have a two-year clerkship within the uh, judiciary itself. And at the end of that two years, uh, they're assigned to a court. They may not necessarily be a sitting judge at that point. Uh, they may do legal research. They may uh, have other type of administrative judge uh, jobs working within the court, but eventually they reach the trial level um, and are, are, you know, become a trial court. Uh, the real issue is once we get them out, can, we, can they be retrained? And the National Center for State Courts in the U.S. is involved in looking at ways to do that. Um, there are some projects, uh, some states allow special practice rules. Um, there's all sorts of different opportunities for them here. Uh, but the younger judges, most likely, if they want to practice as attorneys, will have to go to U.S. law schools. Uh, it's a little bit different in Europe, depending on where they go. In Ireland, um, uh, they can do a, a one-year master's program and be eligible to be a solicitor there. So depending on where they go, it's a, di it's a different question. Was there any resistance to them becoming lawyers or judges in Afghan initially? Oh, well, I think, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, when the Russians uh, uh, um, took over Afghanistan, you know, they had many, um, uh, opportunities for women to study and do advanced study. Um, so the older judges uh, went to school and, uh, and studied law. There was Sharia uh, schools of law. Uh, they were very well educated. Um, and so after 2001, uh, there were positions available to them. And, you know, the Taliban in the six years that they ran uh, the country, they appointed many, many judges that were by and large, mostly illiterate. And I don't think it was, an, it took them years to actually change the law in Afghanistan to say, if you're gonna be a judge, you have to know how to read and write. Um, and, but our judges, they knew that already. All of the women judges were highly educated. It was not uncommon for them to, at first, uh, be sitting in a panel of judges and they would be the only literate person in the panel. The two male judges um, would, neither one of them would know how to read or write. Um, that changed, I think it was, I'm not quite sure what, I, I don't really remember what year they changed the law and required everybody to have a university education in law and go through this training program. Um, but the judges that first came over in 2004 and five uh, clearly were sitting in those kinds of situations. So yes, of course, and there was tremendous discrimination against them. Uh, they really had to, uh, um, you know, be strong, uh, and they were. I mean, they, they're incredibly resilient women. When they came, when they came to Vermont, I, that was the thing that I remembered the most about it. They were just so amazed at how easy we were with colleagues and that there was no issue of gender um, and the respect they got. Our chief justice, you know, met with them and, uh, you know, did, uh, I think he did a constitutional law um, uh, program for them. And, 
you know, that was what they said. They said, he just treats us with respect. It was really telling. Um, I think that has obviously with time, all of that has changed. Um, and that's pretty, the, the, this is the tragedy. The younger women judges who do not remember the Taliban are raised in this educated class of Afghan women. And again, they are an educated uh, group of women, which does not reflect everyone, all the women in the country. Um, but uh, I think they're very assertive and they have, um, you can see them in the news clips of women demonstrating against the Taliban. You know, they want their rights. Um, the truth is now, though they've been crushed by violence and, uh, you know, violence wins in the short run, but I don't think it wins in the long run. Did all of the women judges who came to America speak English? And if so, how did they learn it? Um, no, actually, I don't think any of them spoke English. Uh, we had two interpreters with us, uh, and they were uh, with us all day long during the programs. Um, we communicated, um, you know, we communicated very easily. And, you know, when I look back, you know, we, you know, everybody knows how to cook a carrot, you know, slice a carrot, you know, we would get around dinner, you know, there was a lot of uh, times when we didn't have the interpreters and we actually did pretty well. The younger judges by and large are learning English. Um, they learned English in school. They understood it was, if they wanted to have international opportunities, uh, English was a, a good second language to have. Uh, so it's different for them. Um, Judge Anissa now, uh, she actually understands quite a bit of English, but she's studying away in Poland, getting ready for Yale. Um, and, but you know, it's impressive. What types of cases did the judges rule on in Afghanistan, the women judges? Um, well, they were appointed, I guess I can, I was gonna take off this, um, the PowerPoint. They uh, <clears throat> uh, sat in all courts. Uh, the only court that there wasn't a woman on was the actual, what they call the Supreme Council, the, uh, that court. Um, they were in the toughest of courts, including the courts at Bagram, you know, which tried terrorism, tried the ISIS uh, terrorists that were arrested and held by the military. They uh, were in the uh, drug courts, um, the corruption courts. These are very dangerous courts because these are courts that deal with corruption within the administration itself, within the government itself, and uh, not easy not easy courts mm. to sit in. Mm. Um, no, they stepped right up. Um, in 2000, uh, I think it was in 2010, they created um, courts against, uh, that were specifically about violence against women, you know, dealing mm -hmm. with those kinds of crimes. They, the interesting thing right now is the judges that are most at risk were judges that, uh, sat in family court. And the reason why is because when the Taliban took over, they let all the criminals out of jail. And uh, men who had been arrested, perhaps they uh, murdered their wife um, and were sentenced to prison for that. In the family court proceeding, the judge may have given custody of those children to the wife's family. And those children are now hidden from those men and they're released and they want those children back. Uh, so they feel the way to get those children is to come after the judge uh, because they think, and it's probably erroneous, uh, that the judge will know where those kids are. So uh, they're under a lot of rest, uh, at risk. Um, but at the same time, uh, they put I mean, just to give you an example, the day the Taliban came to some of the provinces, judges were still sitting in court. And one judge told us that she did her, even though she knew the Taliban was literally in the town, she sentenced uh, a member of the Taliban uh, for uh, criminal, uh, uh, some sort of criminal behavior. Uh, and he said to her, okay, today you sentence me, 
tomorrow I sentence you. And she didn't even go home. She called her family and said, pick me up and leave. And uh, they left uh, that village for uh, another part of Afghanistan. So um, they're pretty brave, brave ladies. Yeah, absolutely. To what degree were the Afghan judges on, under surveillance and have their, were they having their phones and their online activity monitored before and after the fall of Kabul? Well, that's a really good question. Um, we communicate with them through Signal, um, which is a, um, a you know, more uh, heavily encrypted um, text program. And you can call as well on that. Uh, you know, who knows? Um, right. you know, my my feeling right now is that the Taliban, the type of institutions they need to run a country, and one of those is security and intelligence services. Um, I don't think they're running to the same, up to the same degree yet. Um, I think if they were, our judges would be much more at risk than they are at the moment. Um, having said that, there's several layers to the Taliban and there's they're just the sort of people that are roaming the streets. Um, and, you know, they're, they're at that risk. We know they come to judges' homes repeatedly hoping to find them. Um, we know that uh, that level is is going on. Um, you know, some of it it's a little unclear about the basis for detaining people. Um, some of it's just um, they want to rob them. I, you know, essentially they'll pick them up and their family they hold them hostage and their family has to come and pay ransom uh, to get them out. Uh, there's quite a bit of that going on. Do you see any glimmers of hope for girls' education in the future in Afghanistan? What I believe in is um, you're not going to hold women back. Um, it just isn't going to work. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like, but those young girls um, that are now young women, uh, you know, they're not going to, um, I don't think they're going to stand for this. Um, you know, I don't know what that looks like or what that means. I think that uh, right now there's some preliminary, um, you know, I lost electricity during this and I don't know if you're hearing that everything. We're hearing you just fine. Okay, great. Everything is sort of turning on around me. <laughs> like, no, we can see you and hear you just um, fine. The, uh, you know, there are some schools are being allowed to operate. It's very random. Uh, the Taliban has, I believe, said that, that girls can be educated up until the sixth grade, but probably only in certain subjects. Uh, some of the universities are operating partially where women have to be, um, they're sitting on one side of the classroom and they're divided by curtains um, and they have to be covered totally. I mean, it's all sorts of, you know, things like that. Um, you know, it, I think what ha it's going to depend on who actually gets control of the country because there's different factions within the Taliban right now. And I'm certainly not an expert on this to talk about it, but I think those those factions could be easily explained as uh, slightly more liberal or what they call the Taliban 2.0, um, but also what we think of as the original Taliban, more violent, more restrictive. Um, and it's, I don't know who's gonna win that battle, um, but apparently it's it's going on. I don't, I just don't know what it's gonna, I mean, that's part of the problem. We just don't know what the future is gonna bring. But ultimately, um, I think the oppression of women um, is not going to serve them. Um, you know, not to mention the practical aspects of how many women in the country actually worked and did the work 
of government. Uh, and they are, they've deprived themselves of that entire workforce. Uh, the passport offices, you know, they have a hard time staying open. And I think that's because many of them were staffed by women who actually knew how to issue a passport. I mean, you know. It's Unfortunately, very... I think we're out of time, but thank you for just a, such a thought provoking presentation. Patricia, we really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for the opportunity um, to it was do this. Really, really good to have you cover this material and give us uh, an inside perspective. Yes, thank you. I agree. Amazing. You are an angel, a true angel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patricia. And good luck. Keep us posted. I will. Thank you. I want to know how this, how this unfolds. Thank you again. Thank See you. you, everybody, and happy Valentine's Day. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.